Oxford University Press Higher Education Webinars. And now, Oxford is proud to present Art Markman, Smart Thinking, From the Lab to the World. But what I want to do today is just talk to you a little bit about uh, some work that I've been doing uh, on, uh, in thinking, and in particular uh, in, in idea generation, uh, which is one of, of a number of topics that I've looked at over the years. I've certainly studied decision making and categorization and similarity. And the, uh, the work on analogy that I did early, starting early on, um, I've continued in, in, and looked at some issues about how it is that people generate ideas. Uh, this first slide reminds me that I need to thank some of my co-authors uh, and collaborators on, this, on the project. I'm going to talk about Julie Lindsay, who was a great graduate student at Texas in the Mechanical Engineering Department, who's now at Texas A&M. And Chris Wood was my colleague for many years in Mechanical Engineering, and he's, he's actually moved to Singapore. Um, also, I have a picture of our psychology building, because every time someone here gives a talk, we're supposed to show off that we have a really cool building. So I've done that. Uh, so now if anybody bumps into Jamie Pennebaker, you can say I've done my duty and shut off the building. Um, so okay, here's what I want to do. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, cognitive psychology and one of the things that I view as a potential limitation of what it is that cognitive psychologists do. In particular, um, in, in an effort to appear as, uh, well, for two reasons, partly in an effort to appear as, as scientific as possible, and partly uh, because we want to be able to run our experiments over uh, as large a group as possible, uh, cognitive psychology is allergic to the content of what people know. And instead, we, we tend to focus our energy on the structure of what they know and to use that structure to help us to organize the experiments that we run and the tasks that we perform. And I'll just give you a couple of examples of what I mean by the structure rather than the, than the content. So research on analogy, for example, uh, if, you, if you look at work by Dedry Gentner, by Keith Holyoke, uh, and a variety of their colleagues, a lot of what the field of analogy has settled on is the idea that when people are forming and using analogies, what they're doing is, is that they have inf knowledge that is structured so that you have relations in one domain uh, that one thing causes another, uh, and, and you have similar sets of relations in another domain. And what you're trying to do is to find the, the maximal match between the relations in one domain and the relations in another. So in the well-worn and somewhat tired example that the atom is like the solar system, uh, what, what matters in the analogy is that you have some, some uh, elements that are revolving around some central point in each one, and the properties that describe those, uh, the, those uh, elements don't matter so much. Now, defining analogy in terms of this broad idea of having relations that match across domains is something that allows you to say something about analogy, regardless of what, the, what domain the analogy is a part of. And, and that's a very powerful thing to do. There's something very um, wonderful about that. Um, to give you another example, in research on categorization, there's been a tremendous amount of, of work that has tried to explore whether uh, categories are best described as being uh, having a structure with a prototype where you create an average member of, of the category, or whether you actually store the individual examples or exemplars that you've seen before and then categorize each new instance based on its similarity to, to that prototype. Again, it doesn't really matter what the category is about. It's really about the structure of that knowledge rather than its content. And consequently, when we study uh, analogies, when we study categories, or, or in the case of decision making, we often use gambles to try and study, uh, study decision making. We're really trying to focus on, on the setting up a structure of a particular sort without really trying to bring to bear the background knowledge that people have before they come to the experiment. And partly that's a, a practical matter. We want to be able to run college undergraduates. They're plentiful on college campuses. And we can't really necessarily know a lot about what those, uh, those students know before they come into the experiment. But it has really focused us on studying what, if I wanted to bring it to its absurd but logical conclusion, I might call party games. That is, these are often puzzles. That, that don't really rely on prior experience and can be taught to someone or given to someone or studied in about an hour, which is about the amount of time that we have people in our experiment. Now, 
I've started this off in a, in a somewhat negative way because I do think that this approach is somewhat limited. But I want to acknowledge up front that, that the field of cognitive psychology has learned a tremendous amount about the way that people think using these kinds of tasks. Uh, you know, the, the study of analogy, as, as one example, has, has really had a, a tremendous influence on our understanding of educational processes, on our understanding of, of metaphor, um, just based on, on a focus on the, um, the structure of what people know rather than the content. But I think that because we tend to focus on situations that we can contrive in the lab that don't bear much resemblance to what people know before they came to the lab, that we've hit a wall in certain areas. And analogy, uh, analogical reasoning research, despite being a real success story in one way, is also an example of how we've hit the wall. Because while uh, the structure mapping theory of analogy and, the, and as I say, the work of, of Dedry Gentner, Keith Holyoke, of their various colleagues and collaborators over the years, has, has really uh, advanced our understanding of this process, there has not been a tremendous amount of meaningful new work in this, in this area for quite a while. And I think that one of the reasons for that is that while there's general agreement in the field on the model of analogy that I just described, um, it's very hard to figure out how to go beyond this while studying only things that people don't know anything about before they entered the lab. And so one of the questions is, how could we move forward with this? How could we try and push forward with, uh, uh, with, with new research? And, and I would argue that one way to go about doing this is rather than to continue to focus on situations in which the content doesn't matter, we should try to find domains where the content really does matter, and embed our theories in those domains, use participants who, who have a particular type of background knowledge, and study the processes that we care about within those domains. The worst case scenario being that we only advance our, our, our field uh, in, in, the, in the domain that we're studying. That is, we might learn something primarily about a particular type of expert, and so it would be worthwhile finding domains for which uh, that expertise itself uh, would be useful to know about. And in the best case, not only do we advance the knowledge of some field of expertise, but we also learn something uh, fundamental about cognition as well. And, and to give you a demonstration of what I mean by this, I want to I wanna talk a little bit about some work that I've done uh, with, in mechanical engineering design with, with Chris Wood and with Julie Lindsay, uh, and, and to look at how analogies get used in, in mechanical engineering design. So to put this into context, there's been a general observation in research on analogy that while analogies are very powerful, and if you put an analogy in front of people, they're very good at using it. So you, know, you, you say that the atom is like the solar system, and pe people immediately understand what you're talking about, even if they've never thought of the, about that example before. Analogical retrieval seems to be very hard. That is, if I give you a problem, and I ask you to solve it, and you don't know the exact answer to that problem, you're often, you often find it difficult to reach back into your knowledge and find something that you know about that's merely analogous to that situation. If I ask you to solve a problem involving electricity, it's rare that someone will spontaneously start thinking about water flowing through a hose. Uh, and in, in, a, in the classic experimental, experimental work on this, there's Jick and Holyoke's work we, that, that looked at uh, uh, Dunker's radiation problem, Dunker's radiation problem being uh, the problem that you have a doctor who's got a, a patient with an inoperable tumor, and, uh, and so they need to use radiation in order to cure that tumor, in order to destroy that tumor. But unfortunately, radiation strong enough to kill the tumor would also kill the surrounding tissue. So how do you, how do you uh, solve this problem? And, uh, in the experiments in which this was done, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with these, but in these experiments that were done in the 80s, um, they were preceded by an, an analogous story about a, a general who was trying to attack a fortress. And because the general was worried that the roads leading to the fortress might have mines on them, the general divided his army up into, into smaller groups and converged his army on the fortress, and therefore ensured that the, that, that, that the attacking force would meet uh, at the place that needed to be destroyed. 
And this is analogous because Dunk, the, the solution that Dunker wanted for the radiation problem was that you should, you should shoot weaker rays of radiation at the tumor, converging them on one place, so that the, 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 the rays that hit the healthy tissue were too weak to, to destroy it, but that the radiation that was focused on the tumor would, in fact, be strong enough to, to destroy it. Um, the, the observation in these, in these experiments is that very few people spontaneously use the story. But, but most people will use it if they're prompted later. And so the question becomes, if analogy is supposed to be such a, a powerful way of solving problems, how could you fix this? How could you help people to retrieve analogies uh, when, in fact, they, they generally find it really difficult? Now, the problem with studying analogical retrieval is that if you really want to fix it, and if you take the memory literature seriously, memory, the memory literature tells us that, that in order to retrieve something that you know before, you have to create some overlap, some, some degree of similarity between the current situation and, and the, the knowledge that you, that you stored in the past. Which means that in order to do this effectively, you have to begin to worry about what sorts of things people know, and in particular, how, how they can develop a vocabulary for all of these core relations that, that, that are part of an analogy um, that might help them to retrieve things that they've encountered in the past. So what we did was we wanted to, we, we, we embedded an experiment on analogical retrieval in a design problem using mechanical engineering students who had, had already had a, a fairly significant amount of training in mechanical engineering. The idea being that, that mechanical engineering students one of the things that, they, that they're given is a significant amount of training in ways of thinking about, representing, and describing a variety of relations that hold within the domain of mechanical engineering, about the flow of forces and the flow of energy uh, that, that make products work effectively. And, and as part of their design training, then, they are learning techniques to try and help them uh, do things like use their prior knowledge effectively to, to design new products. So what we did was we, we, we created an experiment that in certain, in its outline, is analogous to the, to the studies of Jick and Holyoke, only it's embedded in a mechanical engineering context. So we had, we, we, in week one, uh, we had students read extensive descriptions of a variety of products. Uh, and some of these products were going to turn out to be analogous to um, to, to a design problem that they were going to solve later, and others were going to be distractors. So for example, they read an extensive description of, of an air mattress and how that air mattress works and how it's designed. Uh, they read about a toy uh, that, that, would, that, that could both uh, contain things and then be broken apart to allow those things to escape, as well as some distractors like a, a pancake flipper and, a, and an airplane and things like that. Um, Later, a week later, they were going to solve a design problem, uh, and that they were going to solve two design problems. One was they were going to be given the the the, uh, the specs to to create to design a product that would allow people to lift weights while they were on the road. So obviously, they didn't see this this cute picture that I have here, um, but they they were asked to to design some some travel weights, and they were also uh, told that they were that they had to. Uh, to design a flower duster, uh, and, and there were constraints in each case. In the, in the case of the flower duster, they had to be able to design that product using only wire. Um, I'll focus primarily on the water weights uh, right now. Um, so the, the students in the first week read these descriptions of the product. They had to read them and understand them well enough to be able to answer a quiz. And along the way, we varied whether the description that was given to them was given in very domain-specific terms. So in the case of the air mattress, was it really focused on, uh, on, on being able to, you know, to, to fill the, uh, something with air? Or was it given in more domain-general terms? That is, did it focus on, uh, on, on in the, you know, in, in, in the process of inflation and the process of, of containment? Okay. After a week's delay, we basically ran this in, in a class, and so they, they, it was on two consecutive class meetings with a week delay, they were given the design problems. And again, 
the, the design problems were, were described either in a very domain specific way. So if you were describing the, the, the specs for the, water, for the travel weights, uh, the question was um, the question was focused primarily on, on the mechanics of uh, developing weights for, for travel. Or the, 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 pro, the project could be described in, in much more domain general terms. And along the way, uh, after pe people were given uh, a chance to play with this pro uh, project spontaneously, and then they were asked to actually use some of their uh, some, some specific techniques that engineering students are designed to develop what's called a function structure for the, the project. That is, they were encouraged to think through some of the relations that they're taught about. And, uh, and ultimately, the question was, to what degree were people able to solve this new design problem? And in particular, to what degree were they able to design it in a way that, that, that used a design that was analogous to one of the products that they were presented with earlier? Um, this project is, is described in more detail in a paper in, in, uh, in, a, in, a, in the journal uh, Artificial Intelligence in Engineering Design, and, uh, and, uh, and I encourage you to take a look at that if you want the details. But, um, but there are a few things that emerged from this study that were, that were interesting, partly on the mechanical engineering side, but actually partly on the psychology side. Uh, on the mechanical engineering side, um, it turns out that having domain general descriptions in memory uh, those were retrieved better than domain-specific ones. So to the extent that when you were learning something, you focused on the broadest possible way of thinking about the relations, that made it easier for you to apply that knowledge to a new situation, um, to a new situation when you encountered it later. The second result that emerged was that domain-specific representations of the new problem were helpful. That is, when you read about the new problem, it was useful to have a lot of detail within the domain in, in many ways because they forced the designer to think through a number of the details, um, which allowed them to then think about what they were really trying to accomplish. However, once you thought through those details, it was also useful to then use this more formal language that they had been taught, this functional language. At the point, so, if you, so we, we calculated over the course of the experiment when people generated good designs and when they get generated good designs that use the analogies. And the good designs that use the analogies uh, uh, tended to appear at the point where people were really forced to describe the problem with this more extensive relational vocabulary. So there is, is great value in teaching people how to think about relations. And there's great value in giving people a vocabulary for talking about those relations and then training people to describe new problems with those relations. And then the last thing that, that we found that I thought was very interesting, particularly from the standpoint of, uh, of the study of analogy within psychology, was that if you looked at the problem, at the solutions that designers uh, gave to the problem, they showed evidence of using the analogous solution earlier than they showed evidence that they explicitly retrieved the solution. So in many cases, those conditions that promoted retrieval of analogies would, would lead people to come up with a solution that looked a lot like one in, in the analogy that they saw earlier. Um, and they would they would just they would develop that solution earlier in the in the process than when they actually would explicitly say, oh look, I, I remember I, I studied the I studied the air mattress. I can give you a solution that's analogous to that. Um, and this is this is parallel to some work that Chris Shun and Kevin Dunbar have done. They've observed a, a similar finding that uh, that people are often able to act as though they are making use of an analogy without necessarily explicitly uh, recalling it. And I think that that observation, which has now come out of a few studies, is one that warrants some additional investigation, perhaps by bringing it back into the more traditional kinds of laboratory settings. So let me take a step back from all this before I open things up for some questions. Um, there's clear value in, in, in collaborating with people in content domains. And I think that this is something that, as, as psychologists, we need to do a lot more of. We need to work with people in other domains um, to, to help us um, to embed our studies in a content that, would, that, that, that is richer than the one that we normally look at. 
I should also point out that not only is there value to just working with people in other domains, there's actually great value in stepping outside the lab altogether. And, and another thing that I, I really want to encourage people to do is, is not just to stay focused on our scientific literature, but to think about ways that we can bring that, uh, that literature to the outside world in part to answer a question that nags at many of us at times, which is deep down, do you believe that the things that we do really work? So uh, if you're a physicist and you're studying stress of materials, and, and you then collaborate with people in engineering to do that, um, ultimately you end up believing that what you've studied ha uh, worked because people do things like build bridges and they build buildings. There's a question as to whether a lot of the things that we've studied in analogy, in decision making, in reasoning, um, do those things really affect the way that people go about their daily lives? And I think it's very useful for all of us to spend some amount of time talking to people in the outside world and engaging in an exchange of ideas. Uh, I, I've, I've, over the years, have spent a lot of time talking with folks at a number of companies, most notably with Procter & Gamble, which seems to have a great interest in, uh, in, in psychology. And uh, it turns out that many of the kinds of things that, that we do as psychologists do translate to what people are doing in the outside world. So as an example, Procter & Gamble uh, has, over the years, uh, developed a, a series of processes that they call innovation by analogy, that they use with their employees as something that they use as on a regular basis to try and help them generate new ideas uh, for, for products. And, and many of the, the recommendations that they put into their process emerged directly out of the psychology literature involving collaborations uh, between their folks and, and a number of, of psychologists in the field. And I think that that's a, a valuable way of helping us to, 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 to ground ourselves in the observation that what we're doing works not just in the laboratory, but in the world as well. And I think that the world is changing. I, I think that, that you know, uh, I got my degree in, in 1992. And at that point, very few people that I knew were spending time doing things outside of the lab. And there was a tendency to look down your nose at people who were doing more applied research, as if there needed to be a fairly clear separation between doing basic research and doing applied research. But I would say that, that as a science community in, in the 21st century, we need to do a lot more outreach to the broader world. For one thing, it's very clear that the world is interested in cognitive science. So the, the pop science books, both by reporters like, like Gladwell or, or Dan Pink, uh, or, or by scientists like, like Steve Pinker, those, um, those, the market for those books, I think, suggests pretty strongly that there are people who are generally interested in what it is that we need to do. Um, I've also seen a, a notable uptick in the number of, of reporters who seem to be interested in getting angle, cognitive science angles on stories, both through phone calls I get asking for my opinion, but also as the editor of the journal Cognitive Science, I see that reporters often uh, want to get contact information about authors of, of recent papers. And uh, I find it uh, interesting that businesses seem to care what, what we think, not just big companies like Procter & Gamble, but I've had the opportunity to speak to a number of local business groups in Austin. And we get a very big turnout when you want to tell people how to think more effectively or how to be more innovative. Uh, so, so there's definite, definitely an interest. And um, you know, one way to characterize this is that, is that we, as, as psychologists have to be at the leading edge of a revolution in education. The modern uh, science curriculum got laid down at the beginning of the 20th century. And at that point, uh, biology, chemistry, and physics made the cut because they were quite mature sciences in, in, you know, in, in the early 20th century. A hundred years later, uh, psychology is also a mature science that has a lot to tell people. And we really need to do a better job of getting that work out there. Because everyone has a mind, everyone, uh, most everyone is going to be asked to think for a living. And yet few people uh, who are asked to think for a living know how that mind works. And I, and I really do think it's up to us to teach them. So 
what I recommend doing is, is for each of you over time, is, is stepping outside of your university, step outside of your lab, step outside of your research, and speak, speak to other people. There are, there are, every town has local business groups that are, that, that are looking for speakers. Um, take calls from local reporters if you can. Start a blog. Um, you, can, you can start one on, you know, just using Google Blogger or, or WordPress or, or with one of the great venues that are out there, including Psychology Today and Huffington Post and a number of other places. Talk to community groups. I've got a talk I'm doing next week for, uh, for a local town and gown society and, and, you know, people, the contacts you make there are wonderful. Um, you could write a book. Um, I, as, as, as they say on TV, this is a book that, that would, would, uh, that, that's been published by another network. But, uh, but, but you can write a book to try and, and, and uh, introduce people to, uh, to an aspect of what you're interested in, although that's kind of an extreme investment of time. Um, and I think that the, that, that the field of psychology benefits. Uh, the, you know, increased visibility, I think, is always good for what we do. It, and for one thing, it might help to inoculate us, as most of us have had the experience of sitting down on an airplane. And when somebody finds out we're a psychologist, their first question is, is oh, I, or their first comment is usually, oh, I bet you're analyzing me now. And it would be nice if, if we sat down and somebody said, you know, and if you said I'm a psychologist, and they said, oh, you know, what area are you studying? Um, that, I'd consider that to be a bonus. Um, I think it would also may perhaps help us to help to inoculate us a little bit from from some of the funding decisions that have been made lately. Uh, psychology is routinely on the chopping block when the economy goes south, and I think that the more that we do to clarify what it is that we do that's beneficial for the broader community, uh, the fewer discussions that will be had about whether to cut the psychology budget. Uh, I also think that that it generates a tremendous amount of goodwill. Um, to the community, uh, universities in various places are under attack uh, as uh, you know, bastions of learning apparently are not uh, benefits to society, according to some. So the more that we go out and spread the word about what we do, the more that we are helping to generate goodwill from our community. And, and finally, you, know, uh, you might even get paid for it. Uh, that is, your, your expertise may actually turn out to be value in real monetary terms to, uh, to companies. And, you know, I don't, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that there are some people in this world who are more likely to believe uh, a piece of information when they've paid for it than when they got it for free. As a leader in higher education, Oxford University Press is committed to broadening the ways in which faculty can share and discuss cutting-edge research in the discipline. Our Psych Talks and Cultural Psych Talks seminars showcase the authority, innovation, and excellence in the discipline. If you or someone you know would be a good candidate to lead a session, please reach out to us at jane.potter at oup.com. Bookmark our webinar site to view a schedule of our upcoming live webinars. Browse by session and sign up right on the site. To provide feedback on today's session, please visit the following link and fill out a short survey. You will automatically be entered in a chance to win $50 in OUP books from our Academic and Trade Division. Your feedback will also help us to refine our presentations going forward. And lastly, you can always visit our website to see Oxford's growing array of psychology titles. Thanks for visiting, and we hope to be able to connect with you again soon.